Hello, Mr. Breeding. I've imprisoned you in the Matrix. The only way to escape back to the world of the real is to watch and explain every Matrix movie. Oh, I think he's gonna pop. Gonna pop. Uh, fine. The logos are green and sh that's cool. And you know, Warner Brothers is green and glitchy. You know, something's wrong with the world we are about to enter. Boys and girls. And even worse, some freaky looking Japanese katakana number hybrid thing is running down the screen like blood running down a urinal is the, the first metaphor that came to mind. It definitely shouldn't be admissible in court. And anyway, over this not blood, we hear a conversation about how a man is currently watching another man, but a woman wants to take a shift watching the man, which is kind of hot. Even hotter, she's worried the phone is bugged. And before I can double check to make sure I'm on HBO Max and not Pornhub, it turns out that she's right. And a bunch of cops enter a building and they, and they let the fat one kick down a door to reveal a pretty leather lady. Oh, is there such a thing? Some FBI looking some bitches show up and are immediately annoyed the cops went in without them. And the cops are like, I think we can handle one little girl. And the FBI guy who looks kind of like the uh, Lord of Rivendell, weirdly, is like incorrect. Your men are already dead. We then cut back to the leather lady who, in fact, murders everybody in the coolest possible chair kicking, wall running, air floating ways. And also she shoots this random cop like 15 times. <laughs> She then whips out a cell phone from like a decade or so before smartphones were invented, but it's still pretty rad. God damn it. She's then told her hard line has been cut and she's got to get out of there. Whatever that means. And now it's a foot chase between her, the cops, and the FBI dudes, and she and the FBI looking dudes make some impossible jumps, but eventually she reaches a payphone, which she puts to her ear seconds before it's slammed by a truck driven by an FBI guy. Hope that call was worth it. Now Clark Kent is gonna have to change in the alley like some jackass. But anyway, the FBI dudes inspect the rubble and determine there's a decided lack of pretty leather <laughs> everywhere, so she must have escaped somehow. This is starting to feel like a confusingly gritty Bill and Ted reboot. <laughs> Speaking of, cut from there to a sleeping Keanu, which is the least effective but most undeniably adorable Keanu form. Aww. His computer texts some stuff at him and tells him to follow the white rabbit, but before he can yell at his computer or throw it out the window, some redheaded dude and his three weird friends knock at the door and demand a software thing. Keanu gives it to them and the dude is like, thank you, you're basically like Jesus. <laughs> Interesting. He also says Keanu looks terrible, and also the redheaded guy loves mescaline. And does Keanu think that maybe combining those will result in a net positive? Keanu, who's named Neo, by the way, says, Rob's not, but then he notices a white rabbit tattoo on one of the girl's shoulders. So he says, okay, never mind, I'll go to your dumb party. So that's the story of how Neo finds himself at this horny S&M leather daddy club. And the pretty leather lady from earlier, from the intro, comes up and is like, hey, I'm Trinity. And Neo's like, oh, sh I thought you were a dude. Most guys do. Which isn't the most polite way to greet somebody. Mind if I squeeze in here for a moment? Oh! But Neo asks her what the Matrix is, and it's like the movie you're in, dummy. You can't kill me, Matrix. You need me to find your daughter. No, not that one. Then Neo's alarm goes off at exactly 9.18, which is not a great time to set your alarm for. He's like, oh, I'm late for work, but I'm like, yeah, because you set your alarm for 918, you moron. I work from home and I still don't wake up that late. Neo's boss is understandably pretty pissed at Mr. Anderson. Oh, okay. So his, his full name is Neo Anderson. And he's like, you gotta be here on time or you're gonna get fired. And Neo Anderson is like, yeah, I'll do better. And then immediately proceeds to sit in his cubicle with his computer turned completely off. I, I actually don't think he's very devoted to his work. A FedEx guy walks over and hands him another one of those timeless cell phones and it rings and a guy named Morpheus says, hey, the cops are gonna arrest you unless you do exactly what I say and put yourself in a situation to maybe fall off a building. Neo gives it a try, but ultimately wusses out because have you seen those parkour gone wild videos? You said <laughs> and he's arrested. Neo is interrogated by one of the FBI boys and it's revealed that Neo is his hacker name while Thomas Anderson is his straight-laced computer software man name. They want him to help catch Morpheus, who they claim is the most dangerous of men. Neo says no, flips the bird, and then they f***ing sew his mouth shut with magic and give him a literal stomach bug. That feels excessive. But then Neo wakes up, so maybe it was a dream, except never mind. Morpheus immediately calls and says, no, it wasn't a dream. Meet me under a bridge. And Neo must have had terrible parents because he agrees to get picked up to meet the stranger under a literal bridge in the middle of the night. The people in the car, including Trinity, just suck him in the back seat. 
uh, like with a machine, like a machine that sucks out his tummy bug. Man, it reminds me of high school. Am I right? Jesus Christ! Eventually, Neo is delivered to a very happy and smiley Morpheus. Morpheus tries to explain what the Matrix is. You can't kill me, Matrix. Again, no. But yeah, Morpheus admits he can't really explain that all here, but all the things he just said about fate and control and being slaves to the system sounded rad as hell. So they needed to be said. Morpheus offers Neo two pills. If he takes the blue one, he'll forget everything that happened and wake up in his bed. But if he takes the red, he'll learn what the Matrix is, what it truly is. And Neo takes the blue pill, and that's the end of the Matrix franchise. Roll credits. Thanks everybody for watching this video. Please like and subscribe so we can continue making more of these things. I love you guys. We do it for you. It's for the fans. We couldn't do it without you. You guys are the best. I love you, Mom. He took the red pill. He took the red pill? <laughs> Ugh. All right, so whatever. Neo walks into the adjacent room and there's a bunch of leather clad computer dweebs with computers and shit and he sits down and they start putting electrodes on him. Morpheus tells Neo that he ate a tracking program or something, but Neo isn't paying attention because a broken mirror kind of fixes itself in front of him. So he touches the mirror, but it's really sticky and he ends up accidentally eating it because Neo is a toddler. <laughs> this sort of kills him, I guess, and he wakes up in a vat covered with tubes and looking like a gooey, hairless, skinny Bane. I was born in it. He's not the only one, however, as he realizes he's in like an infinitely large warehouse full of red pods, presumably filled with other hairless weirdos. A definitely grossed out robot flies up and chokes Neo a little bit, but before he can call it daddy, leather daddy, it unplugs a tube from the back of his head. Then Neo's flushed like a gooey turd, but before he drowns, he's scooped up by an arcade game called Thing. He wakes up on an operating table with a bunch of acupuncture needles in his body and Morpheus claims they're rebuilding his muscles because he's never used them before. Nor his eyes for that matter. My eyes! And after gaining a little strength, Morpheus tells Neo it's it's not actually 1999, it's like 2199 or thereabouts. And they're on a hovercraft called the Nebuchadnezzar, presumably referring to the biblical king who went nuts and started eating grass like a cow. It's piloted by a motley crew. Apoc, Switch, Trinity, Cypher, Tank, Dozer, and a mousy little named Mouse, who really needs a self-esteem talk since they all got to pick their names. You could have been Ghost Blade or Titty Wolf. Aim higher, my dude. Tasty wheat. They use this Nebuchadnezzar thing to fly around and hack into the Matrix. Neo still has no idea what the hell they're talking about, so Trinity guides him to a raggedy-ass chair and shoves a tube back into his head. He wakes up in a white void that Morpheus refers to as the Construct. He claims they can put anything in there, from guns to clothes to an elderly gentleman who is surprisingly honest about all sorts of consumer goods. Morpheus finally then gets down to brass tacks and explains, okay, so in the early 21st century, humanity created a truly sentient artificial intelligence that in turn crapped out a ton of other sentient machines. At some point, a war between us and them started, and as a last ditch option, humanity shot so much into the sky that it blocked out the sun in the hopes that the solar powered machines would just slow down and die like your calculator after a few hours of writing boobs over and over by yourself in the dark. The machines pivoted though and decided to use humans as battery. And now they grow them in fields and to make sure they don't freak out about the whole thing, the machines built their very own metaverse for them to live in. That metaverse is called the Matrix and is a million times cooler than Zuckerberg's metaverse will ever be because it doesn't require a damn Facebook account and is seemingly lacking in Nazis. Other people have mentioned how humans would make for crappy batteries, so I won't get too into that, but I will say that if they're growing humans with USB ports in the backs of their heads, surely they could also dumb them down a little bit so that they don't worry so much about their existence? Uh, what's more, why set the Matrix in modern times with guns and computers and hardline phones, which, by the way, they used to jack in and out of the Matrix? Why give humans all these ways to fight back and escape and hack and shit? Why not set it during the Dark Ages, where everybody just sort of sits around and tries to grow corn and stab their neighbors for believing slightly different theological tenets? How would these people ever manage to escape the simulation? Just ride a horse, like, so fast? Come and see the violence inherent in the system! Help, help, I'm being repressed! Anyway, whatever. All the exposition causes Neo to throw up straight milk <coughs> and pass out. When Neo wakes back up, Morpheus is like, yeah, sorry, we don't usually free people from the Matrix after a certain age because their stupid brains can't handle it, but, uh, yeah, we did with you because I believe you are the second coming of the one, which is a dude who was born into the Matrix a long time ago, who could reshape it from the inside and freed the first few humans, and then, and then he died. But an oracle thing claims that dude will come back someday, and I think it's you. Does that information help? Do you feel better grounded in your existential crisis now? Okay, great, thanks. Hope you save all of human existence that you didn't know needed saving like five minutes ago. Then Tank walks in and is like, I was born via 
human sex. In our special human city named Zion. That's near the core of the earth where it's still warm enough to have sex. And wait, did they put acupuncture needles on little Mr. Anderson? You know, to rebuild those muscles. Anyway, want to start training? And instead of throwing up needles, like... Sure. Now, training in this universe means sticking a tube in the back of your head and then uploading sh directly into your brain, like jujitsu or how to cook a killer omelet. Neo very much likes this process. <laughs> Holy sh! Hell yes! Hell yeah! And does it for 10 hours straight, which causes Tank to claim he's a machine. Which is a common positive saying in our universe where machines haven't taken over the world. But I imagine it has very different connotations here. That's like some boss in the 1940s telling his employee like, Man, you're really a Nazi out there today. You conquered vast swaths of work. Very efficient at finding solutions, you were. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyway, Morpheus now wants to see how training is going, so he decides to beat Neo's ass. <laughs> Neo has learned some cool things with his training, like this wall jump, even though it achieves nothing, because how could it? Morpheus just waits for him to land and then kicks the shit out of him. <laughs> Eventually, Neo starts to understand that he can focus and go way faster than is realistically possible because they're basically playing Tekken. And so Morpheus then tries to make him jump really far, and Neo fails this too. And he also busts his mouth on the pavement, and upon returning to the real world, realizes if you die in the video game, you die for real. Just like Frankie Muniz. Bitch, that's cheating! I'm not dead yet! Then, Morpheus walks through a crowd with Neo and explains more things, because I guess the audience is also gonna get 10 straight hours of training. Neo sees a hot lady and is understandably distracted, except, oops, look again, Neo! You failed the Nebuchadnezzar sexual harassment HR training module, because now she's Elrond and she's got a gun, and kissing him slash her would be deadly. Morpheus explains those FBI guys are actually called agents, and they can basically hop into any person still plugged into the Matrix at any time. If somebody turns into an agent, they become wicked fast and good at fighting, and every time somebody has tried to fight them directly, they've died. But Neo should be able to beat them someday, because agents still have to follow certain rules for some reason. Like, why not make them overwhelmingly strong and turn on God mode? Because then agents won't be allowed to unlock achievements? Anyway, turns out in the real world, robot squids called Sentinels are chasing the ship around and threatening to blow it up. They don't outright say it, but the implication is that if you die in the real world, you also die for real. Also, why is the CG in this 20 plus year old movie better than most modern movies? Anyway, anyway, Cypher is staying up late masturbating or something when Neo walks in on him. <gasps> Whoa! Good Jesus. Cypher gives Neo a little drink and I guess tells him to go back to bed because the next scene is Cypher in the Matrix making a deal with an agent named Smith to get plugged back in. Cypher is tired of eating bad food and fighting a war, so his deal is he'll give the machines Morpheus if he can get his mind wiped and come back as an actor. Now, I understand not wanting to fight a war, but like they could jack in and eat steak pretty much whenever, right? They don't have to eat gruel every day necessarily, but whatever. The machines want Morpheus because he has access codes to Zion's mainframe or whatever, but if Morpheus was captured, surely they just change the codes? Did they make a code 50 years ago and they know they won't be able to remember anything except machine sucks 6969? Whatever. So Mouse is a horny little sh who created the pretty lady from earlier, and he wants Neo to have sex with her, kind of like how most of the weirdos who played Cyberpunk 2077 wanted to watch Keanu Reeves have sex with their character. 20 years later, and everybody still wants naked Keanu in their lives. I've missed you. I've missed you, too. I've missed you so much. I missed your mouth. I missed your heart. Oh, God, I missed your beard. I missed your light. Morpheus saves Neo from having to decide in front of everybody whether he's going to take Mouse up on his masturbatory offer, and then he takes Neo to see the Oracle in case she has some wisdom for him. At the Oracle's apartment, Neo sees a bunch of kids floating boxes around, and one little bald ass hole in the corner f up the cutlery. He tells Neo he's able to do this by remembering that this is all a computer game anyway, and therefore there is no spoon. And he can just up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, whenever he wants. Then Neo meets the Oracle, who just so happens to be an older black lady, and she's like, Not quite what you were expecting, right? At this point, that's the least crazy thing that Neo's seen in the last couple of days, so I think he's fine. The Oracle says that she thinks he's kind of cute, gives him a cookie, and tells him that being the one is like being in love. Nobody can tell you you're the one, you just, you just know. Balls to bones. Then she says you're not the one, which... Seems like it kind of just negates what she literally just said. And she also mentions that Morpheus is going to sacrifice his life for Neo, but that Neo could sacrifice his life for Norpheus. <laughs> Norpheus. Sea cells by the sea Shorpheus. Morpheus drinking a 40 in a death basket. If he wants. Anyway, bye. Ah. The team heads back to apparently the only hardline phone in town, which is 30 miles away inexplicably. But as they're heading upstairs to reach said phone, Neo sees two black cats and says, huh, deja vu. 
which is sort of what he's experiencing, but not really. Deja vu is the feeling of experiencing something you've already dreamed before. What he's seeing is like a coincidence. I.e., what are the odds of two black cats walking by moments apart? Deja vu would be like, oh shit. I remember this black cat from a dream or being like, I, I think I've experienced this before in my life. He's not recollecting the past if the past was three seconds earlier. Whatever. Everybody else freaks out because copy cat <laughs> moments like this usually signal a glitch in the matrix that occurs when the machines change something about the world. In this instance, it turns out they replaced all the windows with brick walls so the team can't escape. Bad guys also cut the hard line. Things are getting so intense that Apoc hands Neo a gun, but... Shouldn't he have already had a gun? Why was he unarmed? He'd done a sh ton of training before this mission, right? Somebody that could have used way more gun training is Mouse, because he whips out two massive machine guns to fight off the impending cops, and even though a half dozen dudes are crammed into one doorframe, Mouse doesn't hit a single one. Nobody is even nicked, except Mouse. He's super nicked. The rest of the team tries to splinter sell their way down a gap between the walls to hopefully get to the bottom floor without alerting anybody, but unfortunately, Cypher is a sneezy bitch and he reveals the team's location, causing an agent to grab Neo through the wall. This inspires Morpheus to slam through the wall and fight the agent one-on-one -on -one in an apparent Arby's bathroom. He gets his ass kicked and is captured, but this buys enough time for the rest of the team to escape. Cypher actually returns to the ship first and uses a laser thing to kill Tank and Dozer. And man, I just feel so bad for their brothers, fire truck and tractor, and maybe like, like wheat processor. Yeah, Wheat Thresher, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Cypher then unplugs Apoc and Switch, who weirdly looks like Neo in this scene, and it kills them. Cypher then threatens to unplug Neo, thereby both, you know, killing him and proving he's not the one, except, oops, he didn't check to see if Tank was actually dead, and Tank electrocutes him into a sneezeless corpse. Tank then brings Neo and Trinity back, and Neo says, yeah, we need to go rescue Morpheus. Morpheus, Morpheus. Go eat some walruses. Speaking of, Morpheus is being tortured by Agent Smith, who basically pumps him full of hacking drugs that'll eventually force him to give up those passwords. While they wait, Smith decides to monologue. He explains that the first Matrix they built was actually perfect, but people didn't buy it because humans presumably define themselves through suffering. So instead, they built another version set in 1999. You know, the peak of human suffering. Now that's more like it. Smith says that he hates it here because he hates the smell. And he's hopeful that if they blow up Zion, he can go on vacation somewhere that doesn't smell. Elsewhere, Neo and Trinity massacre some security guards and initiate one of the greatest gunfights ever put to film. <laughs> they don't even bring extra ammo. They just throw entire guns away when they've emptied the magazines. It's impractical, but it's undeniably badass. Once they've murdered a small village worth of technically innocent soldiers, unaware they're plugged into a simulation and only are aware that two psychos in fetish gear are shooting all their friends to death, Neo and Trinity call the elevator. The two climb on top of the elevator, and Neo whispers, There is no spoon. Which Trinity must have thought sounded a little odd. And then they bomb the sh out of the lobby, which again looks cool, but serves no clear purpose, other than maybe it announces their presence to the agents. On the roof, Neo and Trinity kill some dudes until an agent shows up, and Neo tries to shoot him, but the agent dodges every bullet. Then the agent shoots Neo, who also manages to mostly dodge the bullets, but is nicked at a couple of spots, and the agent walks up to him and is about to plug him, but then Trinity walks up behind him, spreads her legs out about seven feet apart from each other, and shoots him right in the dome. Now, Trinity is wowed by how fast Neo was, but like, She's the first person to ever beat an agent, right? They made a big deal about how nobody has ever fought an agent and won, but she she just did. She shot him right in the, in the head. Trinity must be the one, right? Is that 20 years before shadowing? Maybe. Anyway, Neo and the one grab a helicopter and chain gun the sh out of the room where they're holding Morpheus, killing all three agents again! More agents defeated! They defeated four agents in 10 minutes, despite the fact that that's never happened before in 200 years of war. Apparently, once you pop the top, the fun don't stop when it when it comes to m murder. Morpheus makes a face like a man sh and then runs for the helicopter, but he gets shot in the ankle, so Neo jumps out and catches him in midair. They fly away, but the helicopter gets damaged, so Trinity drops off Neo and Morpheus and then abandons ship and lets Neo catch her with a rope, and it is truly the coolest sh they escape via subway payphone, but before Neo can leave, a homeless dude becomes Agent Smith and they duke it out like a couple of superheroes. Neo mostly gets his ass kicked, but he does get in some cool come hither motions and lands arguably the most hilarious strike in any movie ever. 
but ultimately, Agent Smith wins and throws Neo on the subway tracks. Then Smith hops down there to hold Neo down and deliver another monologue because even dispassionate machines want to gloat over big kills. But Neo gathers just enough strength to throw him off, so Smith gets hit by the train. Five agent losses now. Truly wild. They're killing all the agents. Well, technically they're killing homeless people. So that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. He made a homeless guy get hit by a train. He must be the hero that we, we've been waiting for. <laughs> anyway. So in the real world, Sentinels are about to attack the Nebby, and they do have an onboard EMP thing that'll kill them all on ship, but it'll also kill Neo if he's still plugged into the Matrix. And Trinity explains this all to Morpheus for some reason, presumably for our benefit, but Morpheus is like, yeah, I know Trinity. Jesus, I'm the captain. We can't use that until he's out. I know Trinity. So Neo is running around and steals this guy's cell phone, which is not very heroic, and then Agent Smith enters a grandmother. Eventually, Neo actually just gets straight up shot to death by Agent Smith, which is unfortunate. But then Trinity explains to Neo's corpse that the Oracle told her that she'd fall in love with the One, and lo and behold, she's in love with Neo, so by the transitive property, he must be the One, and therefore can't be dead. Of course, it could also mean that she'll fall in love with some other dude later that'll turn out to be the One. I mean, she's what, like 30? She's got time to find someone else. Get on Tinder. There's a lot of fish out there in the simulated sea. Hey, are you coming? Yeah. But whatever, that's uh, a good enough speech for Neo to come <clears throat> back to life. But now he has the ability to stop bullets in midair. He also sees everything in code, even though I thought the whole thing was once you got good at reading code, you wouldn't really see the code, but whatever. Then Agent Smith tries to fight Neo, but Neo just disrespects him. The ultimate humiliation, Neo eventually enters Agent Smith and just blows up inside of him. <laughs> Didn't even buy him a steak dinner first. Neo then actually exits the Matrix, so they fire the EMP, and all is right in the world. Then Neo calls the machines. Do they have a 1-800 number or something? Who is he talking to? I don't know, but he says he's gonna show people that the Matrix is fake or whatever. Then he literally flies away or rage against the machine blast, which in the business is referred to as perfect and... <laughs> green again. Looks like it's Matrix rebooted, you know, because of computers. It's reloaded? Like a gun? Well, that's stupid. My title is better. Anyway, a bunch of green scribbles eventually transform into a clock <laughs> where a few security guards are clocking out when holy sh a motorcyclist from hell flies through the air and hucks her motorcycle into the guard station like a friggin' bomb. She herself lands like Black Widow, but with even more leather stretched across her tight ass, and she removes her helmet to reveal that she is no longer a stunt double, but the actress actually playing Trinity. And then she proceeds to uh, beat the hell out of the remaining security guards. But then there's a weird glitch transition, and now she's jumping out a 50-story window and shooting at an agent who has jumped after her. Undeniably cool, but also not sure what the plan here is. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? Like best case scenario, she shoots the agent and then he lands on top of her when she hits the ground. Gerald? But that doesn't happen. She gets shot and then hits the ground and then presumably a fully alive agent just plows her. So, yeah, but it's okay, because it's a dream, and people do stupid stuff in dreams. Yeah, oh yeah. Neo wakes up all sweaty, perspiration on a sweater already, and not gonna lie, a chosen one hero dreaming about the death of his sci-fi wife sure feels like Revenge of the Sith, so here's hoping that Neo slaughters a bunch of children because he's sad. But anyway, Trinity's good, because she's right there, sleeping next to Neo in sin. Trinity wakes up, and Neo is like, straight up, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. And she's like, I have nothing to tell you. That it's useful other than maybe the Oracle will know. They're hanging out on the Neb, which is piloted by a new big black man operator named Link, who is played by one of Lost's most annoying characters, but now with dreadlocks. What happened to Tank? Well, apparently he succumbed to a contract dispute off screen, and then he essentially never worked again, so I guess you could say he was killed by the machine. Anyway, the Trinity of Trinity, Morpheus, and Neo hop back into the Matrix and head to an in-person virtual meeting with a bunch of other ship commanders, including a woman named Niobe, when presumably a radio call would have been 
fine. This needlessly virtual scene must have given a young Zuckerberg the thickest chubby. It's revealed the machines are tunneling to Zion to kill everybody and a character we don't know named Commander Locke has ordered everybody on their ships to return to Zion. And Morpheus is like, okay, yeah, we could go back because our ship needs to recharge, but we're still waiting for a message from the Oracle about what the hell Neo's supposed to do. So can somebody else please just like stay inside the Matrix and wait for a phone call from her, even though that's defined a direct order? This guy says, yeah, what up? Are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. Neo, meanwhile, is bored of the meeting and his spidey senses start tingling, so he wanders away. At the front door, a guy who sounds exactly like Agent Smith gives the doorman a package for Neo that just so happens to be an agent earpiece. He also says that Neo set him free. Then, apparently unrelated agents bust down the door and Neo just kicks their ass. Neo mentions that they have upgrades, but like, why can't they be more upgraded. Make their punches faster than bullets. Make them stronger than a sledgehammer. Why are they only 25% better than a human? We have the technology. Stupid. Anyway, Neo fights them for a while, for fun, I guess, and then decides he's done enough uh, because he flies away. And I hope everybody else escaped because Neo sure doesn't check. And on the ground, again, seemingly unrelated to the other agents, a no longer Agent Smith flirts with the clone of himself. Ooh, two of the first movies, villain? Now <laughs> that's what I call a sequel. Perfect. Anyway, Neo at some point returns to the Neb and the Neb returns to Zion, which is apparently guarded by shitty Gundams. Neo has a new mouse kid who follows him around and is his biggest fan. In fact, everybody here is his biggest fan, sort of like the modern day internet. I'm here with Buzzfeed to play with some puppies. Little anecdote here, a big subplot in the early part of the movie is how horny Neo and Trinity are. And when they enter the elevator and are alone for a second, they go at each other real hard. Well, when I was in sixth grade, my mom and sisters went out of town so dad and I could paint the house and have a manly weekend. And as such, my dad introduced me to the first Matrix. And then he said that we could go see Reloaded, which had just come out in theaters, but he'd seen the MPAA and knew that there was a sex scene or something. So the deal was I'd have to wear a baseball hat and whenever the sex scene came up, I have to pull the hat down over my eyes until it was over. And I agreed to those terms because auditory is more than enough for me. But it's not like either of us actually knew when the scene was coming. So when the elevator thing hit, we both audibly yelled and smacked at the hat to pull it over my eyes thinking, oh God, this is it? Hurry or this 12 year old might see a tent. Anyway, good times. I also bought the Enter the Matrix video game that weekend, which ripped. And I'm not gonna talk about it much though because we got enough going on, okay? Morpheus, for his part, goes to meet with Commander Locke, who's both his commanding officer and commanding Morpheus X, now be around the bed. Even worse, the commander doesn't believe in Morpheus's prophecies. He only believes in science. I don't know why you always have to be judging me because I only believe in science. Unfortunately for Locke, this old white dude counselor guy believes Morpheus, so t double tension. Link also heads home wondering, Where's my pussy? He doesn't find it though because his wife is Dozer and Tank's sister and he promised to take Dozer's place or whatever on the neb. Nothing really to that subplot. I just wanted to play the where's my pussy part because Where's my pussy? Hey! I don't know, it felt important. Okay, so now they decide to have a cave orgy, which is preceded by both a prayer from the counselor and a word of encouragement from Morpheus, who says, yeah, the robots are coming to kill us all, but like, counter-argument, prophecies, and that's good enough for everybody, and they start dancing in the sweatiest way possible, creating a five-minute sequence where you can maybe see a lady nipple if you squint hard enough, and definitely lots of man nipples without squinting at all. You also don't have to look very hard to see Keanu's butt. It's like the cyberpunk DLC of our dreams. Cyberpunk. Anyway, the crew that's still in the Matrix, having zero raves and looking at zero probably girl nipples, try to jack out of the Matrix with a message from the Oracle, but before the second guy can leave, he gets fingered by Agent Smith until he turns into Agent Smith. And then that Agent Smith answers the phone, presumably hijacking the brain of that guy in the real world. The message does get to Neo, but the hijack guy also almost murders Neo in the back but then he doesn't. Another time, maybe. Turns out Locke didn't authorize Neo and Morpheus to leave. The old guy did, and this makes Locke upset. Inside the Matrix, Neo meets up with a guy named Seraph, who fights him for a few minutes, because this is a Matrix movie after all, and then says, okay, yeah, you can meet the Oracle now. Please enter my endless hallway of back doors, which is both a hacker thing and a sex thing, they tell me. These doors apparently allow them to go anywhere off the grid. Neo then uses one to hang out with the Oracle in a shitty park for a while, and she dumps a truly epic amount of exposition on him. So try and track with this. <coughs> <clears throat> so, the Oracle and Seraph are not humans, but in fact, computer programs created within the Matrix. So should Neo trust them? Unclear. She says she's only interested in bringing the future to fruition, and Neo has already made the choices that will bring it about. He just doesn't know why he'll make those choices. Okay. 
whatever. What's more interesting is the Oracle tells Neo that the Matrix is full of all kinds of programs. Bird programs, tree programs, wind programs, whatever. And usually they work great, but sometimes they either become outdated or get shot to death by Neo. In those instances, programs are supposed to return to the source, aka the Matrix mainframe, and be deleted, but every once in a while a program says, nah dog, I'm staying, and they hack their way back into the Matrix, though they're then exiled and no longer under its control. But this inevitably screws up the program some, and when they return, they almost always come back as something weird like ghosts, vampires, werewolves, aliens, you know, freaky sh**. Spooky scary. This is not metaphorical, by the way. They literally come back as those things. More on that later. Anyway, the Oracle said all that for no apparent reason other than to be like, and yeah, so you, Neo, need to go to that source too. But to do that, you gotta go find the Keymaker. But to do that, you gotta find another rogue program called the Merovingian, who's keeping the Keymaker captive. Got all that? This is just the tip, baby. The Oracle leaves and Neo's immediately fingered by Smith, but he's able to force his fingers out before he turns into another Smith. Smith claims some part of Neo got overwritten onto his code when Neo hopped inside him, and Smith hacked his ass back in when he was supposed to be deleted, so now he's all sorts of screwed up, except the only apparent side effect is that he can finger people into himself. Smith even successfully fingers an agent at one point. Ow. And so he and Neo and a thousand other he's fight for a while. They fight for a long while with several full-on CG sequences that look way worse than the first movie, and why does that always happen? I swear, the higher the budget of a movie, the worse the CG somehow. Anyway, then Neo finally remembers, oh yeah, I could freaking fly. So he does. By the way, at no point do any of these 7,000 Smiths ever think to pull a gun. The fight takes so long, the old guy from Zion sends two ships to look for them, including one with Morpheus's ex. This also pisses Locke off, because what doesn't? Anyway, the gang throws on their most resplendent fetish gear and heads to a fancy French restaurant owned by the Merovingian, who speaks with a French accent because he likes cussing in French. Nom de Dieu, de putain de bordel de merde de saloperie de connard d'enculé de ta mère. He's married to the bustiest program we've seen so far. The machines must have been very lonely the day they programmed her. They talk for a while about choice and causality and the ends and the means, and as an example of something, the Merovingian sends this woman a piece of cake that either makes her piss and or come. And after that, he says, no, you can't have the key maker. I think this scene is an example of why people are confused by the plot of this movie, but it's actually pretty simple. Uh, none of it matters. None of this conversation has anything to do with anything. They're just discussing themes. There's no exposition presented here. So just, you know, stare at the busty ladies. But okay, yeah, so they leave empty handed, but before they get too far, Busty Belushi shows up and says, no, I'll, I'll help you. But first she takes him to a bathroom and demands that Neo kiss her as hard as he kisses Trinity, which he does much to Trinity's horny chagrin. And then she takes them to a room and shoots a werewolf in the head with a silver bullet and tells the other to go tell her husband. And so far, none of this is super helpful. But then finally, she takes them through a secret passage to a literal dungeon with a key maker who is in fact making a ton of keys in his cell. How good of a key maker can he be if he has a key making machine but can't figure out how to unlock his cell? Anyway, they bust out his useless ass and are immediately confronted by the Merovingian and his goons and it's revealed that the Merovingian gets blows on the red. She wasn't kissing your face, my love. Respect, bro. <laughs> then Morpheus, Trinity, and the key maker run off and are pursued by literal white ghost twins with dreadlocks and British accents and the ability, you know, to become ethereal. Those two groups initiate a car chase which leads to the freeway which all the characters mention is very dangerous and we immediately see why because agents start taking over random people and jumping from car to car and then crashing other cars into the heroes faces. They drive around haphazardly for a while and then pull over so Morpheus can become a cyberpunk samurai from hell and blow up the ghost while Trinity grabs the key maker and a motorcycle. Then at some point Morpheus gets on top of a semi truck which can't possibly be the right move. Why not grab another car that he can actually you know steer and then he swings the key maker up there too which I mean this is a bad plan man. An agent eventually hops up there too and basically why Morpheus's ass. And does Morpheus ever actually win a hand-to-hand -hand fight? He mostly seems content to sacrifice himself fighting agents and Neo's way stronger than himself. It could have been a contender. Also, why is he even able to land a punch at all? Agents can dodge bullets, but not Lawrence Fishburne's fists? Whatever. Morpheus falls off the truck, but is caught by Niobe's windshield because she is shown up in the Matrix. And then he jumps from that car back onto the truck and knocks the agent off. And the agent then turns into the truck driver and crashes the truck into another truck, which is the first thing he should have done because again, Morpheus is not in control of the vehicle he's riding. Back at the chateau, Neo fights the aforementioned 
goons and blocks their bullets and stabs them and sh it's all very exciting but then he opens the door and it turns out that he's 500 miles away from the action so he flies to the action and saves morpheus and the keymaker right before they are engulfed in flames from the truck on truck crash now that they've got the keymaker the three ships still in the matrix come together and decide on this really convoluted plan to get neo back to the source basically they have to break into a building rigged with explosives that will detonate if an alarm is tripped but to prevent that one team will need to knock out a power station and then a second team will need to knock out a, a, a backup power station while Neo Morpheus and the Keymaker open up a door of light or whatever and they'll have exactly 314 seconds to make it through that door before the power comes back on and the building explodes because that is how hacking works. Neo asks Trinity to stay behind because of his dream of her jumping out of a window for no reason. He just can't trust her not to just leap headfirst into a mirror or some shit. Niobe's team succeeds in blowing up the power station, but the other ship is super rusty and shitty, so half of the crew is killed just because of, like, bad welding. And then everybody on board is killed by a sentinel throwing a bomb at their ship. Somebody mentions, by the way, that sentinels can now huck bombs, which keeps them out of EMP range and apparently blows up ships with a single shot. And man, you know when that would have been useful to the machines? In the last movie, at the end, instead of attacking directly for 20 minutes, they could have just thrown one bomb and killed Neo immediately. But I guess they forgot to bring them. So anyway, because these sentinels remembered to bring bombs, Trinity is forced to go in and finish the other ship's part of the mission, which is what we saw in the movie's cold open with the motorcycle and the tight leather butt and all that. She succeeds, but then she's forced to fight a couple agents for the rest of the movie. Neo and friends enter another backdoor hallway, but are accosted by a million smiths. No biggie, they make it through and Neo enters the light door and Morpheus goes back to the ship through another door somehow and then the keymaker just bleeds out because his part of the movie is over. Inside the door, Neo finds a room with a bunch of TVs and one old white dude sitting awkwardly in a gamer chair. He also finds another big exposition dump. You ready? Okay, so Colonel Sanders here is known as the architect. He's the dude that built the Matrix. Unfortunately, he sucks at his job because the first one he built was too perfect, as I mentioned earlier, and nobody believed it. And the second one was too brutal and nobody believed that either. Then at some point, the Oracle said, you know what you need to do is create more instances of choice into the design. So, you know, that's the secret sauce. They did that and it worked for 99% of people in the program and, you know, that's as good as it's gonna get. Unfortunately, there is one weird inevitable bug the one. For whatever reason, no matter what they do, the Matrix eventually spits out some badass dude clad in leather who can basically destroy everything. Furthermore, for whatever reason, the Matrix eventually crashes within a hundred years as it gets further eroded by all them choices. So, to kill two leather-clad birds with one stone, the architect and Oracle created the prophecy of the one so that the survivors in Zion would seek him out and eventually push him and get him back to the source. Once there, the one would be asked to make a choice. He can either return to the Matrix, which will cause the whole thing to crash and kill every human plugged in, or he can go reboot the source and start over a new iteration of the Matrix. And additionally, Zion's gonna be destroyed, but the One can pick seven males and 16 females from the Matrix to repopulate the city of Zion anew and, and you know, keep the cycle spinning. Because here's the thing, Neo is actually the sixth the one and this is the sixth iteration of this version of the matrix in every previous iteration the one went ahead and chose to reboot the system and pick the 23 hottest humans to go you know f zion back to life with in a scene that would definitely require at least one baseball cap maybe two but unlike his predecessors, Neo is really, really horny for one person specifically. Like literally he chooses not to reboot the Matrix because he wants to save Trinity because he loves her so much. So he chooses the death of his entire species, including presumably Trinity, for the chance at just one more little taste of that cave pool. Oh. So Neo flies out the other door that does not lead to the source and catches Trinity before she hits the ground. Of course, he flies so fast, he kills potentially hundreds of innocent people in his hurricane wake, but to be fair, they're already dead per his choices anyway, so no harm, no foul. Trinity has been shot, so Neo fingers the bullet out of her. But she still dies, so he straight up fingers her heart. And that brings her back for good. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the real world, a sentinel throws a bomb at the Nebi, and the four surviving humans run away from the ship, but the sentinels catch up and are magically electrocuted by Neo. His one powers have, I guess, transferred to the real world. And all that effort makes him very sleepy, so he passes out and ends up on an operating table across from the dude that Smith mind-jacked. It's also revealed that Locke attempted a counterattack uh, against the Sentinels that were digging, but it failed because somebody or something preemptively triggered an EMP that knocked out all the good ships. Man, I wonder who did that. We're all trying to find the guy who- Then we get more rage, baby! Am I trapped in some sort of way station halfway between the real world and the simulated world of the Matrix? Guess I better jack back in!
my little juice. So there's still code and colors and crap in the intro, but now some of it's yellow. <gasps> so now it's lemon lime flavored for her pleasure. The crew from the ship that picked everybody up at the end of the last movie is currently looking for Niobe, and more specifically, her possibly still functional ship. Trinity is still hanging out with her still unconscious boyfriend and also the unconscious brain jacked guy named Bane. And Morpheus does a brief search of the Matrix for Neo, even though he's not jacked in, but lo and behold, well, he's not there. <gasps> the doctor lady also mentions that Bane's brain waves look like he's still jacked into the Matrix, which is weird. And then Morpheus gets a call from Seraph saying that he needs to go meet the Oracle ASAP, so he goes back in. Neo, for his part, is somewhere, but it's not the Matrix. As a little girl kind of explains, he's in the train station, which basically serves as the halfway point between the real world and the Matrix. She is being smuggled into the Matrix by her dad and mom, all three of which are machines, because she was going to be deleted because she was useless in the real world. No need for we Indian girls in the machine city, I guess. Uh. And it turns out the train station is run by, get this, the train man. Apparently the Wachowskis have never heard of conductors. This train man works for the Merovingian, so he's gonna be predisposed to not like Neo and probably won't let him on board. As it turns out, what the Oracle wanted to tell Morpheus was, yeah, go talk to the Merovingian about freeing Neo from the train man. Also, she takes a moment to mention that her appearance has changed for some reason, although, you know, the real reason is the actress playing her in the last couple of movies died during filming. Probably should have eaten less candy. Huh? I love candy. Okay, so this is the only useful addition plot elaboration from the Enter the Matrix video game I played when I was 12, which otherwise basically just shows the action behind the mentioned events in these movies as opposed to deepening the lore or whatever. Evidently, the Indian man from the train station gave the Merovingian the terminate code for the Oracle's outer shell in the hopes of killing her and then gaining her powers of clairvoyance in exchange for the Indian man's Indian daughter safe passage into the Matrix. The Oracle allowed this trade to happen because she thought that girl named Sati was important. Unfortunately, that means that her outer shell was killed or whatever, so her appearance changed. Though the Merovingian did not gain her powers because they had to be given. That is definitely one way to explain an actor change, but I still think they should have gone a step further and made her something way different, like a small Chinese boy or a hulking Russian dude or something. <sighs> None of that really matters beyond crazily papering over a plot hole. And Seraph, Trinity, and Morpheus head somewhere to talk to the train man who runs away? Is he worried they'll steal one of his million watches? Tick tock, Miss Dewey. I don't know, but he gets away. So they go directly to the Merovingian who is hanging out in his club that's apparently exclusively for gimps and titty twisters. But first, they gotta kill these guys who can run on the ceiling, which means, what, they're vampires? Or aliens? Those are the only two things that the Oracle mentioned that we haven't seen yet, but there's no sunlight down here so we don't see if they sparkle, so we can't know for sure. Eventually they win and then they go speak to the Merovingian and his wife's heaving breasts and he mentions wanting the eyes of the Oracle, which is again the clairvoyance thing. And they're like, no thanks. And Trinity pulls a gun on him and, and makes a new deal to, to do no deal at all and just give them Neo. And the Merovingian hesitates. So Trinity cocks her gun to show that she's serious. But does that mean that she couldn't have fired the gun prior to that moment and she was just bluffing? Why wait until that moment to cock it? Whatever. The Merovingian agrees and they pick up Neo and he wants to go see the Oracle who tells Neo, yeah, you got stuck in a train station because you touched the source at the end of Reloaded when, when he killed those sentinels which separated his mind from his body. You know, why not? Presumably this means that his full powers haven't transferred to the real world exactly. Like he can just sort of control machines, but like he probably couldn't actually fly or finger people back to life in real life. He could just electrocute machines. It makes sense. The Oracle reveals that Smith is the opposite of Neo, wants to destroy things, which like, I gathered, yup. She also claims that she wants the war to end and basically answers every Neo question with, you already know the answer. I don't think Neo ever asks a question in this entire series that somebody just answers for him. It's always, you, you tell me, Mr. Big Shot, the one. You know the answer, you've known all along. And he's, he's like, yeah, I guess you're right. And um, that's good writing. In the real world, Smithbane wakes up and also so does Neo. I guess they jacked him in, out, off. When did he get plugged in? Oh, hey, Mark. Hey, what's going on? Bane conveniently doesn't remember anything about what knocked him out, but he does a shockingly good Hugo Weaving impersonation, which is kind of fun. You're right about that, sir. And then the crew does actually find Niobe's ship and Niobe's body, and both are still functioning. They recharge her ship, and then Neo is like, actually, I need that ship to drive to the machine city 
to talk t t to the machines. And they think he's crazy, but Niobe gives him the ship anyway. So he and Trinity fly off, but Bane uh, kills the doctor lady and then sneaks aboard like a little stowaway. But not for long, because he attacks Trinity and Neo and ultimately zaps Neo right in his big, pretty eyeballs. And Neo can still sort of magically see anything machine-related because of the, the half powers. So he still manages to kill Fleshly Smith. Then... They continue on, but Neo will no longer be allowed to steer. Uh. Oh, also a million Smiths assimilate the Oracle, Seraph, and Sati. Three minority characters being transformed into three white characters? I wonder if that's a metaphor. Ooh. In Zion, Commander Locke angrily prepares the defenses with huge mechs that nobody thought to put wind shields on. And then, you know, elsewhere in the tunnels, Niobe and the rest decide to return to Zion with their last ship so they can use their big ol' EMP to knock out the robots. Why the hell don't they have an EMP in Zion as a last ditch failsafe? God only knows. Anyway, the crew runs away from Sentinels trying to make it back to Zion in time and they're aided with gun turrets that nobody had thought to use at any point in the past two movies. It's very thoughtful of both the machines and humans to agree not to use their better weapons until the sequels. Uh. But before they get there, the robots drill through, you know, Zion's roof and attack. Sentinels swarm through and everything goes to shit. A sub-battle plot, Link's wife and another lady shoot a bunch of rocket launchers. Eventually, most of the mechs are wrecked, but the ship with the EMP is close, and somebody needs to open the gate so they can come in and fire their, their EMP. This guy would have done it, but his mech doesn't have a windshield, so he dies. Ow. This lets that mousy kid take over and shoot the gate open with an assist from Link's wife. The ship comes in and shoots the EMP, kills a bunch of machines, and also technically all the human defenses too. Wow. They fall back to the temple gate or whatever as the Sentinels attack again. Meanwhile, Neo and Trinity arrive at the machine city and get a bajillion bomb shot at them but Neo mostly blows them up with his brain so it's fine but then they send a bunch of sentinels which he can't do as much against so they just fly straight into the clouds and see the sky for a moment and then they come crashing back down and Trinity gets impaled to death Neo says some things and then hops out to talk to some baby faced machine god king <laughs> He then makes a deal to defeat Smith before Smith eats the entire Matrix and everything everywhere in exchange for peace. The baby head agrees and jacks him back into the Matrix. The Sentinels at Zion also take a smoke break until Neo does his thing. His thing, as it turns out, is to punch the shit out of Smith for a while. Smith has eaten basically everything in the Matrix, so he and all of his clones just watch Smith and Neo get all sweaty and punch each other so hard that they create dry moments amidst the rain. Eventually, Smith wins and fingers Neo into himself, but that was a mistake because then Neo slash Smith explodes in light and then every Smith explodes because the right to choose or consent, the right to repair, I don't know. Neo appears dead in the machine city and the Oracle appears dead at the bottom of a hole and the Sentinels leave Zion. The machines drag Neo's body somewhere to be prepared for a reboot in 20 years and the Matrix itself, you know, heals. Then the Oracle, who I guess is not dead, and the Architect chat a bit and they clarify, yes, there is a piece, but no, it's not likely to last forever. And yes, Neo will probably come back at some point. And yes, the humans that want to be freed from the Matrix can go free, even though doing so and even just explaining to them that they've been plugged in metaverse for a thousand years will presumably break all their goddamn brains unless they're under a certain age. There's going to be so much puking, you guys. I thought I was supposed to be the robot. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Yep. The Anna Jordan? Super clever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Doesn't add much to the story, though. Oh yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> Get a grip. <laughs> all right, well, so the Animatrix exists, and it's a collection of animated short films about the Matrix. Thus, the Animatrix. <laughs> You get it? So the first one is called The Final Flight of the Osiris, and it is quite literally just the story of the ship that first noticed the machines were tunneling and how they got out that first message to Niobe. The opening scene, though, is two sexy people sword fighting each other's clothes off while blindfolded in a sparring program. Then the ship in the real world gets attacked by sentinels and it accidentally gets chased to the surface where they notice, hey, there's some machines digging. Probably to Zion. The sexy lady then jacks into the Matrix to leave a message about this via extremely convoluted parkour while the ship tries to stay one step ahead of the Sentinels. She succeeds, and then the ship explodes, and they all die. Great. Then we've got the Second Renaissance, which is divided into two parts for absolutely no reason, and both of which are the only stories to give any true interesting additions to the established Matrix lore, which is delivered by this sexy, nearly nude angel lady for some reason. I mean... I guess I know the reason she's a sexy nude angel lady. It's, it's perfectly tailored for the exact type of person watching this. So it starts with things that we knew. 
man built machines, turn them into slaves that build things. And uh, you know, all along they're getting smarter and smarter. Eventually this culminates in a murder trial with a hilariously named robot called B166ER. Yeah, the robot is named Bigger. Just like my penis, am I right, Dave? <laughs> anyway, Dickbot3000 killed somebody. <laughs> and half the world thinks he should just be shut down on the spot, while others think he should get an actual trial like any other sentient being would. They decide to just shut him down without a trial, which leads to a ton of violent protests that result in tons of machines being killed and hucked into the ocean. In response to all this violence and anger, the machines build their own city called Zero One somewhere in the Middle East. As one might expect, their economy immediately becomes way better than every other country's, and that makes them all so jealous. And the machines try to broker some sort of deal, but humans say no and blockade them instead. Then, naturally, they just nuke the shit out of the machine city. That doesn't really get rid of them, and the machines retaliate and kill everything in their path. So the humans put a bunch of nanites in the sky to block out the sun. This doesn't appear to do much, and the robots still kill everybody and turn them into human batteries. So basically, it's all humanity's fault. Classic humanity! Then we get a story about the mousy kid from Reloaded and Revolutions called Kid Story. His name was Kid. There's nothing that's interesting about it other than Kid, the, the kid, he starts out like Neo, asking questions of his computer, and then he's forced to run from agents. Well, technically he skateboards from agents because he's in high school. And then eventually he jumps off a roof, but instead of dying, he somehow self-substantiates and escapes the Matrix all by his damn self. Lucky guy. The next story is called Program, and it's basically just an excuse to animate a bunch of samurai sh**. Some woman fights some stuff, and then some dude is like, hey, I'm gonna jack back into the Matrix and leave this all behind, and you should come with me. And she says no, so they fight a bit, and then she kills that dude. And she's sad about it. But then she comes out of the program and they're like, just kidding, that was a test. And she's like so annoyed. She just, she shows a little bit of her butt. <laughs> like out of the top of her underwear, it's like anger butt crack. Then we get World Record, where a narrator tells us that most people that escape the Matrix have this rare degree of intuition or sensitivity and a questioning nature. But not everybody, because cut to a black athlete, which... That feels weird. He'd previously set the world record for the 100 meter dash at 8.99 seconds, but it was revoked for drug use, which is a little weird again. But the guy decides to beat his record again, fair and square, even though his trainer is worried that doing so will severely injure him and end his career. He does it anyway and his knee explodes, but he fights through the pain and runs so hard, he actually wakes up in the real world for a second before a robot zaps him back in. He breaks the record, but falls and is injured because again, his knee exploded and it ends with him in a wheelchair whispering, then we get friggin' Beyond, a story where basically there's a haunted house in the middle of town full of physics-defying Matrix glitches. And a girl plays there with the Matrix's version of Ed, Ed, and Eddie for a while. I got it! Until agents show up and fix the glitches. That's it. That's Beyond. And then there's a detective story, which is basically a noir film about a dude hired to find Trinity. Eventually he does, when she sucks a bug out of his eye. <laughs> And then he realizes that he was hired by bad people to find her, and he and Trinity try to escape some agents, but he starts to transform into an agent, so Trinity shoots him halfway through the process. She says, sorry, and he says, I don't blame you, but like, she could have just kept running, right? No need to put him down. Anyway, as he dies, he tricks the agents following Trinity and pulls a gun on them like he has any chance of freaking shooting them. They're agents, you idiot. They're very fast. And then, finally, we get a story called Matriculated that is mostly a bunch of visual nonsense. The basic plot is a woman on the surface and her pet monkey trick a couple machines into coming back to a lab with her. Once there, the robots are attacked by another robot. Then they take one of the original beat up robots and plug him into a simulation in the hopes of converting him into an ally of humanity. They don't wanna just reprogram the machine, they want to truly convert him. How do they do that? By throwing him into a kaleidoscopic world of geometric shapes and naked women. <laughs> it takes forever, but eventually he's converted, I guess, because I mean, show me a few naked ladies and a couple of really shiny shapes and I will fight whoever you want. Am I right, Dave? <laughs> but this is right as enemy robots attack, which the, the converted robot helps defeat, but he's mostly too late and everybody else is basically already dead except his favorite naked woman. So he plugs her back in to presumably have sex with her for all eternity, but then she dies, I guess. <laughs> and that's the Animatrix, baby. You're welcome, the internet. I hope you learned something here today. I didn't. Why do you look different? Computers. Total effing MILF. Okay, so this time the logos start not green, but then become, in fact, green. So, <laughs> Matrix, it's back, and it's more confusing than ever, so buckle up! Interestingly, 
The whole opening scene plays out like a student fan film of the original movie. Two people on a phone call discuss watching somebody and how the phone line is being traced. From there, we see a leather lady, Trinity-esque person attacked by cops and agents that are different because notably one of them is now black. Yeah, it's not the same, but it's basically the same, but not the same, basically. Before we get too far into it, we see that inside one of the walls is a woman with blue hair named Bugs. As in, bunny. What's up, cock? She's watching the scene alongside a Halo Marine mixed with an Xbox gamer looking operator dude named Sequoia. Apparently operators can now manifest inside the matrix and yell shit people directly. Tech has improved. Sequoia mentions what Bugs is doing is against the general's orders, but Bugs says, actually it's important that they watch because it seems familiar and they know what happens next. Yeah, is the general aware of that, Sequoia? She doesn't have all the facts, which, by the way, wouldn't care about her feelings at all. Yeah, you effin' with some wet ass P word. Anyway, Bugs says not Trinity is going to kick their ass, but it's really more like us because she's British. She kicks their ass. Then there's a fight scene that's similar to the opening of the first movie, but notably much lamer. No crane kicking or anything, just a little nudge with her foot to a forearm. Again, Kind of looks like what a student film with no budget would attempt. Cool for 19 year olds, less so for a $190 million budget blockbuster. The scene then transitions into a knockoff version of the opening chase scene, but it plays out differently and the agents actually capture Trinity. But then Bugs sort of goes down there and gets involved and then they chase her, but she manages to escape with the black agent into another hallway of back doors, ultimately falling into Neo's old apartment that somehow looks nothing like Neo's old apartment. In there, Bugs and Agent Lando talk a bit and it's revealed they're in a modal which is a program used to evolve other programs or whatever. So this is like a simulation of the first movie, which explains why it's the same, but everybody looks a little different. Speaking of, it's revealed that this black agent guy is Morpheus, but like not really. Just like how that not Trinity dominatrix from earlier was not Trinity and they chat for a bit. And Bugs mentions that even though Neo is presumably dead, she thinks she saw Neo almost jump off a roof a while ago. And that's what convinced her that the Matrix wasn't real, even though the dude in question also looks nothing like Neo. And in an effort to further the small talk, Agent Morpheus also claims he saw some code in the mirror one day and decided the Matrix isn't real, even though he's a literal program designed to protect the Matrix, but he wasn't aware of the Matrix? What system did he think he was protecting? Just like the, the man? Anyway, this horrifying mirror moment gave him enough angst to want to escape from the Matrix. So Bugs makes Agent Morpheus choose between a red pill and a blue pill, and obviously he takes the red pill, and then he and Bugs run around for a bit from the other agents, and it turns out the pill makes Morpheus very silly. <laughs> In general, this version of Morpheus is just a silly little goofball. I've never worn different glasses before. <laughs> Eventually they extract him, which is crazy, because again, he's not a human, he's a program. Oh, and during this chase scene we learn, okay, so now any humans in the Matrix can use any door to travel literally anywhere by utilizing one of those classic close and reopen, and oh look, now you're in Diagon Alley or whatever moves that the Keymaker was so fond of and reloaded. And also, there's no more hardline phones. All you have to do is find a mirror, presumably any mirror, but they sure seem to have to run around a hell of a lot looking for mirrors, when in my experience, mirrors are damned everywhere. They should be able to escape from like 50% of all rooms and 99% of all buildings in existence at any point. Cut from there to Thomas Anderson, legendary video game designer. That's right, Neo is back in the Matrix. But his hair is long, and he's going by Thomas Anderson again. And in this world, the original Matrix trilogy is actually a series of fictional video games. <laughs> Meta enough for you, just wait. He's working on a new game called Binary, but he's not super pumped about it. And he created that modal thing from the beginning because I guess he just likes those original Matrix games he made a lot, and so he wanted to simulate the first one. And he also sort of thinks about killing himself a lot and or hooking up with Trinity, who is now a leatherless married MILF who frequents his coffee shop and goes by Tiffany, even though they don't seem to know each other. And Anderson's boss, named Smith, tells him that they're... Does that, did that make any sense? I don't think it does. What, it does. what I just said, all that I, I, think it, I think it makes sense. Okay, great. The MILF. That, yeah. Yeah, amen. Total effing MILF. What's up, cock? But anyway, Anderson's boss named Smith ba, 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 tells him that their parent company, Warner Brothers, like literally 
That's what he says. Wants him to make a fourth Matrix game. Enter the metaverse, am I right? Then we get a super cut of a bunch of nerds trying to parse like, what is the Matrix, dude? And they mostly land on bullet time and F with your head. And all this makes Anderson sad again, so he visits with his therapist to talk about these episodes he has where he remembers scenes from the video games that are actually movies as if they actually happened. So he's prescribed some blue pills and told that he's not crazy because they don't use that word. But yeah, he's off his nut. This is demonstrated by Smith's mouth it's getting sh sewn up like in the first movie and also Neo seeing some other old dude's face in the mirror occasionally. This is a good time to point out that 10% of the footage in this movie is old clips from the original kind of better movies. I guess in case we forgot there were other movies. Very helpful. Speaking of, Anderson then eats some noodles because that's a sci-fi trope and they really messed up not having a scene where he did that in the original movies. Then, sad Anderson gets up the courage to talk to Tiffany. They have a little coffee date, even though her husband, Chad, is nearby. Anyway, Tiffany reveals that she likes to ride motorcycles, and also, she wants to know, is that girl in the game based on her? Because she thinks it is, which, it's a weird thing to think, right? Why the hell would those video games be based on her? Total effing milf. That's like me wondering if Master Chief is based on me, because I also am secretly in love with a computer program. It, it's just a coincidence, lady. Well, it would be if it wasn't this movie. Of course it is based on her, naturally, even though, how could it be? He doesn't know her. Milf, milf, milf. But whatever. She gets a phone call and the date is over. <sighs> Anderson goes back to work and gay Morpheus accosts him in the toilet and is again, very silly. Uh, wasn't too sure about the callback, but you know, it's just hard to resist. What? He wants to break Neo out of the matrix because, well, they think Neo is cool. Like everybody in this movie just thinks Neo is a cool dude. That's it. That's the only reason they need him for his coolness. They didn't even know he was alive. So it's not like they have anything writing on this. They just, He's so cool. What? But then the SWAT team busts in and starts shooting things and then Smith remembers, oh right, I'm evil. So he grabs a gun and sort of shivers orgasmically and then attacks Anderson. This sequence is again, almost cool, like the movie Equilibrium. I'm coming. It sort of just makes you wish you were watching the lobby shoot out of the first film for the hundredth time instead of this largely competent, but still underwhelming facsimile. Smith shoots Neo in the head, but I guess it doesn't kill him because cut from there to again, Anderson with his therapist. The therapist is not super helpful, so Anderson decides to jump off the roof again, but wait, Bugs is there and she shows him her cool white rabbit tattoo. And so he and her go through a door to like Tokyo because I guess there are no mirrors in this part of the world. All the mirrors are in Tokyo. Oh shit, that's a movie title. Eventually they wander into another kind of underwhelming facsimile scene. This one mirrors <laughs> the original red slash blue pill moment from the first movie. And while they're there, gay faux Morpheus tells Anderson, hey, nothing conquers anxiety like nostalgia. So I recreated the scene to try and put you at ease. And I, I wouldn't say that this movie has subtext so much as shit into your face text. Oh, and it's revealed, apparently, the machines have been hiding Neo's body for 60 years by changing his appearance and his source code and brainwashing him or, you know, whatever. Who gives a shit? Agents and cops attack before they can exposit any further, of course, so they go through another thing onto a train somewhere. And again, there's a fight scene so constrained and chaotically edited, it would fit better in the Bourne series rather than the freaking Matrix. It even has god awful, shitty, low frame rate, slow motion stuff that wasn't even that impressive when Resident Evil tried it. <laughs> somehow, they somehow miraculously find a tiny little mirror and Anderson slash Neo wakes up in a machine pod thing again and he appears to be across from Trinity but before he can slime his way over to her he's grabbed by a robot and taken to a hovercraft. Morpheus is on board sort of because they've invented some kind of nanotechnology called paramagnetic oscillation or some bullshit that allows him to sort of manifest physically in the real world. Furthermore, the robot that picked up Neo is a fully sentient machine called a sentient of course, who has allied with humans because some machines are now on humanity's side because we're the only ones who appreciate Van Gogh, probably. Neo is sort of dying because he doesn't fully believe what's going on, so Morpheus and Neo hop into another smarting program. Oh my God, like the first movie to get Neo's mojo. And I'm taking it with me to the moon. And Morpheus also reveals that he's not just an approximation of Morpheus, He's also an approximation of Smith. And apparently Anderson believes that those are the two main people responsible for turning him into the one, you know, way back when. So he squished them together in that modal thing from the beginning because 
Though he was kind of running a test for his game, he was also simultaneously trying to recreate the situation that caused him to be freed and become the one in the first place. So that explains why this iteration of Morpheus was originally an agent and why he's just so darn silly. Both he and Smith are infamous for their wackiness. Put them together and look out. Whoopee cushions under every, you know, jack-in chair. Uh-uh. No joke. So yeah, Morpheus puts on some gay ninja robes and punches Neo for a while and eventually goads Neo into punching him so hard everything explodes because it's a lot easier to obliterate shit with CG than choreograph an interesting fight scene. That's in the art of war. And maybe the art of the deal. So now he's mostly Neo again, I guess. And back on board, we sort of meet the rest of the crew, but essentially none of them matter, so I explain who they are. It's also revealed that this iteration of the Matrix is brand new, and they were wise enough to patch the Oracle and the Architect out of it. Okay, so now they enter a new human city called Io. There's a simulated sky thing, and the girl plants and shit by reverse engineering Matrix code into real things. Like they are programming strawberries that are also somehow juicy fruit that you can eat with your real mouth. And it's run by an old ass Niobe because remember it's been 60 years and she explains, okay, so yes, Morpheus became the king of Zion and there was peace with the machines and a ton of people were freed from the matrix, which caused an energy crisis and a civil war between the machines. Morpheus incorrect and somehow incongruently believe that A, all machines were evil and should never be befriended, and B, the peace would last forever, so they won't attack us. But they're evil and they would attack us if we befriended them, except they, they wouldn't. But anyway, that confusion caused him to ignore warnings from the Oracle that the machines are gonna attack again, and as such, he was killed, and Zion was eventually overrun and the peace ended. And Neo is like, okay, whatever, I don't care. I want to save Trinity because I'm in love with her and I want to go home wreck her family. And Iobi's like, no, we don't really do that anymore. Io is well hidden and we're committed to creating a sustainable ecosystem and freeing people just means we'll need more resources. So we don't really do that. And then Iobi throws Neo in jail so that he won't go after Trinity, but then he's freed 11 seconds later by Bugs and the crew. Great. So now they're in the Matrix again, and they're immediately confronted by Smith, who didn't know he was Smith before, but does now, and also the Merovingian, who is now a trash person. He's also got his old werewolves and whatever goons, but that's more of an Easter egg than a plot point. Who's becoming men? Men becoming wolves. Apparently, the new Matrix doesn't have very many exile programs anymore, just these stupid trash people. Smith was somehow kept alive, but rebooted and brainwashed just like Neo, because their bond is important, maybe. And also maybe so that the new architect guy, Matrix creator called the Analyst, could keep an eye on Smith in case he found his way back into the new Matrix or something. I don't know, computers, hacking fate, choice inevitable. Smith doesn't want Neo in the Matrix because he doesn't want him to save Trinity because he doesn't want the Matrix to crash or get rebooted because that would get, cause him to be reassimilated. And he, he still wants a chance to kill the analyst and take the Matrix over again. Neo says, no thanks, I'd like to get Trinity, please. So they fight. And again, the fight scene between them kind of blows because it's mostly just you know, like chest punches and pushing around. Just a couple of tough boys posturing, aided by the fact that Neo's punches are now increasingly aided with a CG-enabled force power buff. Neo wins for the time being, naturally, and goes to see Trinity at her bike shop when, oh no, the analyst shows up. It's his therapist. By the way, don't know if I mentioned that. It's... It's a little easy to get lost in here. Anyway, the analyst believes that bullet time, i.e. the ability to go hella fast, is the main source of Neo's power, just like the nerds thought you know, was the main cool thing about the Matrix earlier when we were talking about that. So the analyst has created a scenario where time goes impossibly slow except for the analyst. And it looks kind of cool, I guess. I mean, less cool is how it's exclusively used for even more goddamned exposition. So here we go. All right. Like I already mentioned, the dude is named the Analyst, and he was built as a program to study the human psyche. To that end, he resurrected Neo and Trinity initially to study them, but he found out that together they produced like so much energy. If they became too close, their glowing groins would destroy the Matrix, but if they were close but not too close, they became the best batteries ever. Even better, he discovered that all humans produce more energy if their lives are constantly trapped in a state of heightened fear and desire. Basically, he gets all Shapiro for a second and says, here's the thing about feelings. They're so much easier to control than facts. And being isolated and lied to heightens those emotions and creates the cycle of constant fear and desire, which both cause people to buy into the lie of the Matrix and produce more literal energy. This movie is a Gritty Monsters, Inc. reboot where fear is actually the best energy source. So get out of here with your stand-up routines. And again, the text here is nothing like U571. 
you know, like not s sub. Die, die, die. Speaking of, like and subscribe if you're still here. So that's what this new matrix is built around. Heightened emotion that clouds judgment. In the center of it is scared and horny Neo and Trinity. Then the analyst says Neo should plug uh, himself back in or he'll kill Trinity. Then he lets Neo go, but in the real world, a second hovercraft has arrived and brings them back before Niobe. She's mad that they disobeyed a bunch of direct orders, but then she's like, whatever, it's not like I'm gonna stop the third act from happening. So sure, break out Trinity. To that end, she lets Neo talk to a sexy program called Sati. Good morning. No, you perv. She's no longer a child. She's a grown up and objectively very pretty. Total effing milf. Anyway, she reveals that even though Trinity and Neo did actually die at the end of Revolutions, the analyst wanted to bring them back, right? To study them because of, they were anomalies, because he thought they were two peas of the one pod. He also theorized that putting them back in, you know, would, would make a lot of energy, like I said. So he wanted to rebuild them because maybe that would solve their energy crisis. So he had Sati's parents build resurrection pods that somehow rebuilt Neo and Trinity, even though they're dead, or they were dead, and got them plugged back in. I don't understand. The what? But Sati's dad didn't know they were gonna get plugged back into the Matrix, so he gave those designs to Sati, like, like Mads Mikkelsen in Rogue One, and for that betrayal, they were purged. And meanwhile, Sati was saved by a sexy stealth dolphin robot. Sati has known that Trinity and Neo were alive for a while, but didn't tell Niobe because she wanted Niobe to focus on rebuilding Io. And all along, Sati's been watching the two of them by working in a coffee shop called Simulate. Sati has a plan to break Trinity out, and you may be surprised to learn that it's complicated as sh**. The movie transitions into a light heist film with a big plan revealing everything. Okay, so Translucent Morpheus will sneak in and open a door that'll let some of the others in and they'll sort of partially disconnect Trinity and then go into the Matrix and politely ask if she'd like to leave because it's not kind to free people from brain prisons unless they say it's okay first. Then, if she agrees, they'll plug Bug's brain into Trinity's digital cell for a bit because I, I think so they, they have time to remove Trinity's body from the sludge and plug it back into their ship, and then, and then they can unplug bugs faster than they would have originally unplugged Trinity, so then they can escape uh, faster. Does that make sense to you? Do you feel like you understand now? Good, because I don't. So that's the plan, but before that, Neo goes back into the Matrix to basically make a deal with the analyst, saying, okay, if Trinity agrees to leave, you need to let her, but if not, then you can just plug my ass back in. The analyst agrees, and Neo and Trinity have a little conversation, and Neo's like, you're trying to leave? But before N Trinity can decide, Chad and her not real family come in and are like, hey, mom, your daughter broke her arm, and Trinity's like, I guess I should go with them. But then Chad makes her upset, so she decides, never mind, I won't. Here's hoping your mom isn't one comment away from leaving your dad for Keanu Reeves. I'm sorry. The analyst tries to renege on his deal, but then Smith shows up and starts killing everybody in the room, which is ass to ankles full of cops, and that buys the good guys an escape window, and then Smith disappears from the body he was controlling. No idea where he ends up. But uh, who cares? The analyst then activates swarm mode, which transforms the movie into a zombie movie for a bit, because they had 20 years to think of ideas for this movie, and they're gonna they're gonna shove every goddamn one into it for the love of shit. And apparently, this new Matrix is like PUBG in that it's flooded with low-level bots that can attack at any moment. It's a little disconcerting how many unarmed, regular-looking people get gunned down in the street and forced to commit suicide by jumping off buildings like cars in Fate of the Furious, but I guess that's what fun is? Am I having fun watching suicides in the murder of innocents? I suppose that's better than the first three movies where civilian cannon fodder was actually human people, but... Still not my favorite thing to watch. Eventually, Trinity and Neo end up on a building and kiss, but with like way less tongue than when they were younger. Pfft, still in love, my ass. Neo blows up a couple of helicopters for old time's sake, and then they just decide to jump off the roof because that's apparently always Trinity's first plan. It's like, hey, do you know how to get to Target? She's like, yeah, I do see it, bitch. It's not a great plan, but it's worked in the past. And oh, look, she can freaking fly now. Apparently this version of the Matrix created to the ones, or maybe they've always been two parts of the one, but Trinity never realized, or even better, maybe Matrix 5 is gonna reveal that Neo's sister has the gift too, and Trinity is that sister, and they're about to birth some squid looking 
babies. It's a trap! But until then, they fly away and then they kiss some in the real world and then they go back into the Matrix and literally punch the jaw off the analyst and tell him they're gonna remake the world or whatever and there's nothing he can do about it. He's actually not that worried about it because he believes people like living in this shitty, emotionally heightened world and Trinity and Neo are like, nah-uh. But also, are all the humans in the Matrix currently ones that chose to remain originally? Or are they still growing humans on the side? Like, did that start back up again? Feels like that'd be worth knowing and relevant to this conversation, but whatever. They threaten the analyst saying that if he tries to interfere or reboot this version of the Matrix, then the machines will purge him. Even though we have no concept of how machine society actually operates or who is in charge, but I guess that's a good threat. Then credits roll with a sacrilegious Rage Against the Machine cover song. Tell me deep in the system. And eventually end on a logo for Girl With Her Ass Out Productions. Oh, and of course there's an end credit sequence where some guys are suggest they make a bunch of videos called the cat tricks because cat videos are popular <laughs> all right you can go god 